All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. I've been coming at you with a series of video presentations for the Rankin Technical College EWD Application and Web Development 1111.NET Framework with Web Databases class. For this class, the main book we're scheduled to use is what you see on your screen right here, ASP.NET MVC with Entity Framework and CSS by Lee Naylor. Book with tons of code and at least occasionally lacking on the information that goes with it. I like the book. The, the, the gentleman who wrote it is really good. But I think that in order for students to understand it, I decided to go over this book first, not all of it. So far I've gone over chapter one. of This is Professional ASP.NET MVC 5 by John Galloway of Microsoft and others. So far I've gone over chapter one, Getting Started, Chapter 2, Controllers. Chapter 3, Models. Chapter 4, Chapter 3, Views. Don't know why I keep saying that. Chapter 4, Models. Chapter 5, HTML Forms and HTML Helpers. And Chapter 6, Data Annotations and Validation. Which brings me to Chapter 7 on Membership, Authorization, and Security. Now, you're going to find that although there may be quite a few videos on this, I don't know. I'm not going to go into this in the depth and breadth of coverage it probably deserves because I'm not a security guy. All right, but I'll go over what I can. Then we'll go over Chapter 8, Ajax, then Chapter 9, Routing, skipping Chapter 10 on NuGet, skipping Chapter 11, ASP.NET and Web API, skipping Chapter 12, Single Page Apps with AngularJS, skipping Chapter 13, Dependency Injection, skipping Chapter 17, Real World, ASP.NET MVC, building the NuGet.org website, but doing Chapter 14, Unit Testing, Chapter 15, Extending MVC, and Chapter 16, Advanced Topics. So that's the game plan. So we're going to start up Chapter 7 right now. And as you can see again, it is Membership, Authorization, and Security. Requiring login with the authorized attribute, requiring role membership using the authorized attribute, using security vectors and web application, and coding defensively. Much of the information in this chapter, um, at least towards the end, talks about different types of security problems you could have. Now, years ago, when I worked for another institution, all right, I work for a different technical college in, I guess you'd call it Southern Wisconsin. Um, I did a series of security presentations for a company that I was farmed out to work for. And what I'd like to do if I can is to find those presentations. Don't know if I can or not, but I'm going to try. And if I can find those presentations, what I am going to do is add them to the list of presentations I have here. All right, we'll see how that works. I don't know if it'll work or not. So, securing your web apps. It says can seem like a chore, but it's something you have to do. No, security doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. The good news is we want the chapter to, chapter to be informative because security is important. Yeah, that's true. All right. This chapter, as it says, is one you absolutely must read because ASP.NET MVC does not have as many automatic security protections as ASP.NET Web Forms does to secure a page against malicious users. The number one excuse for insecure applications is the lack of information or understanding all right, or understanding on the developer's part. Yeah, I love what they say right here because it's so true. Never, ever trust data your users give you, ever. Just assume that any input data you're getting is bad. You can assume it's malicious. It doesn't matter. But you have to assume you have to sanitize it. Here are some practical examples. Anytime you render data that originated as user input, encode it. Think about what portions of your site should be available for anonymous access. Require authentication on all others. 
don't try to sanitize your user's input yourself using regular expressions. You never heard of look up white hat versus black hat. Use HTTP only cookies when you don't need to access cookies via client side script, which is most of the time. Remember that external input isn't just obvious form fields, it includes URL query string values, hidden form fields, AJAX requests, which is the next chapter, results of external web services you're using, and other things. Consider using the anti cross site scripting encoder which is now distributed with ASP.NET 4.5 and higher. It says there's, apps, there's, there's obviously a lot more that we can tell you. So, and they will, but it is impossible. You can, in one chapter, it is impossible to cover everything regarding security for a lot of reasons. All right? So you can buy whole books on security. There are whole books on security. It says if you haven't faced problems with security before, excuse me, it's usually for one of two reasons. Either number one, you haven't built an application, or number two, you haven't found out yet that somebody hasn't hacked your present, you know, your, your application. All right. It says discussing this topic or talking about it starting like this might seem a dire way to start the, tra the chapter, but as they say, it's not personal. There are people out there that will try to break into websites, if for no other reason, to see if they can. The majority of these people, not all of them, but the majority of these people are not trying to do anything malicious. All right? They're just trying to see if they can get in, etc. But of course, 5 to 10% are. They want to get in and they want to do damage, whatever that damage may be. So, the first simplest step to, in securing an application is requiring that a user be logged in to access specific parts of the application. You can do that using the authorize action filter on a controller. We'll see that in just a couple minutes. It's important that you realize the difference between authentication and authorization. When you first log into a system, you are being authenticated. So when I got in this morning and I logged into the system I have here at Rankin Technical College, it asked for my login, it asked for my password. I gave them both successfully. Once I was authenticated, then I could be authorized. All right, in other words, authentication is verifying I am who I say I am, Whereas authorization is verifying what I can do once I've been authenticated. Without any parameters, the authorized statement just requires that the user is logged into the site in any capacity. In other words, they're not anonymous. So it says, assume that you naively started your music store with a simple shopping section. It has a store controller that has two actions, an index which displays a list of albums, and buy. All right, which probably means you want to come in there and buy albums, right? However, obviously, you're not done because the current controller would allow a user to buy an album anonymously. You need to know who users are when they buy an album. If for no other reason, who are you going to charge? Where are you going to send the album? You can resolve this by adding the authorized attribute to the buy action as shown right here, which means that once they get to the buy, they have to be logged in. It says to see this code, use NuGet to install this into a default ASP.NET project. All right. It says a default MVC project, so let's just come in here. I've already got the music store running, but let's come in here. Let's just start up a project. That we will call, for lack of better verbiage, default MVC. 
right? Once we get all that in, I believe we're supposed to go to the oops, to the package manager in NuGet and key in that. Don't need this, of course. View other windows, package manager console, paste that in. All right. Run the application and browse to slash store where we should see a series of albums don't know I haven't tried this yet but let's try it A very simple start. Okay, there we go. When you click the buy link, however, you are required to log in. Let's check. It's doing its thing here. There we go. Because you don't have an account yet, you'll need to click the register link, which displays the standard account page, figure 7-3. All right. Notice that the standard account controller registration does not track the referrer when you create a new account. So after creating a new account, you need to navigate back to the slash store again. You can add this functionality in yourself, but if you do need, but if you do, you need to make sure you don't add in an open redirection vulnerability that we'll talk about later on in the chapter. All right, so. The old hello with a zero, one, two, three, comma in a capital H. Register. Notice now I am registered right there. Sure, we can save that. Let's go over to bat to slash store as we were before. Now if we click buy, there you go. Again, I'm just following the steps as they're noted in the text. A common means of securing an application with web forms is to use URL authorization. Well, I'm not going to go through that because we're not using web forms. All right. You can't do that with MVC for two reasons. Requests no longer wrap, map to physical directories, and there may be more than one way to route to the same controller. With MVC, it's possible in theory to have an admin controller encapsulate your application's administrative functionality. However, this isn't necessarily secure. It might be possible that you have another route that maps to the admin controller by accident, and they explain that. A good approach, as it says here, to security is to always put the security check as close as possible to what you are securing. In other words, don't have it high up in the hierarchy, have it down lower in what you know you need to make secure. This way, no matter how they got to the resource, there will always be a security check. In this case, 
you don't want to rely on routing and URL author authorization to secure a controller. You really want to secure the controller itself. The authorized attribute serves this purpose. If you don't specify any roles or users, the current users must simply be authenticated in order to call the action method. This is an easy way to block unauthorized users from a particular controller action. If a user attempts to access an action method with this attribute applied and fails the authorization check, they'll get the 401 unauthorized HTTP status code. All right, I want a little behind here in my handout. So I'm on 167. And the author says here, what's going on behind the scenes with this authentication scenario? Clearly, we didn't write any code to handle the log on and the register URLs, so where do they come from? The ASP.NET MVC template with the individual user accounts auth authentication, which is what the way we set it up because it's the default, includes an account controller. Remember, we've got There's our account controller. That account controller implements support for both local accounts and external accounts managed by OpenID and OAuth authentication. Again, I know what those are, but I'm not the one to talk to you about them. I just am not uh, at all an expert in that field. The authorized attribute is an authorization filter, meaning that it executes before the associated controller action. It performs its work in the onAuthorization method, which is a standard method defined in the iAuthorization filter interface. And they show that in here. If the user fails authorization, you'll get the HTTP 401 unauthorized status code. All right. It says it's an Accurate response to an unauthorized request, but it's not entirely user-friendly. Most websites don't return that for the browser to handle. Rather, they commonly ha return or use an HTTP 302 to redirect the user to the login page in order to authenticate. And then they explain here behind the scenes what's going on. I'm not going to go through that. <clears throat> As the author says here, it's nice that the account controller and its associated views are all provided in the ASP.NET MVC with the use individual user account auth authentication template. In some cases, adding authorization doesn't require any additional code or configuration. Equally nice is that if you change any of those parts, the account controller is fairly easy to modify. The authorization work calls Owen. You can go out to owen.org if you want to know more about that. Middleware components. And the authorized attribute is a standard authorization attribute. If you want to, you can create your own. Again, this is not for the lighthearted. This is not for somebody just learning this stuff. But... I did want to go through it so you at least have been exposed to it. All right. So they talk about internet, the internet authentication object. I'm not going to go over any of that. How you do it in IIS, how you do it in IIS Express. It's not that the stuff isn't interesting. It is. But for what we're doing, we're working on in individual accounts. So security, although it's always important, isn't as important to what we're doing as we're learning this. This is the kind of thing that you would go over and spend a lot more time on as you became more knowledgeable in what you were working on. The earlier scenario demonstrated a single controller applied to specific controller actions. After some time, you realize browsing, shopping cart, and checkout each deserve separate controllers. Several actions are associated with both the anonymous shopping cart and the authenticated checkout. Requiring authorization on checkout lets you transparently handle the transition from an anonymous shopping cart to checkout where registration is required in a scenario like the music store. 
as it says, you accomplish this by adding the authorized attribute on the check controller, which again, as we mentioned before, says that all actions that, that basically transpire out of the check con checkout controller, you must be a registered user. All right. Now, to take that further, they mention here on 170 that on some sites, you want the entire site to be secure. Okay, and it's quite possible. It could be a government site, it could be a personal site, could be a business site, whatever. If this is the case, requiring authorization by default and making exceptions in just a few places where anonymous access is allowed, like the home page or whatever, is simpler. In this case, as it says, configuring the authorized attribute as a global filter and allowing on anonymous access on specific controllers or methods is a good idea. To register, as it says there, the authorized attribute as a global filter, you add it to the global filters uh, in app start filter config dot cs. So putting in something like this, that line that you see in bold there, applies the authorized attribute to all controller apps. Global authorization is global only to MVC. Keep in mind, as it says, it applies only to the MVC controller action. It doesn't secure web form, static content, or anything else that you might have in your application. The ob obvious problem, rather, as it says here on page 171, with global authentication is that it restricts access to the entire site, including the account controller. So you got to watch it, make sure that you do allow an anonymous login, for example. Otherwise, you would never be able to even get into the account. Although Allow Anonymous solves this specific problem, it only works with the standard authorized attribute. It won't necessarily work with custom authorization filters. If you're going to use those, you'll want a new feature in MVC5 override filters, which allow you to override any filter. And that's covered more in more depth and breadth of coverage in Chapter 15. We are at 23 minutes, so rather than going on right now in this lecture, to using authorized attribute to require role membership, that will become part two of this chapter's lectures.